Welcome to Interventional Endoscopy Services. Uh, we are about to start a case now of 50-year-old patient who, a lady who was previously seen by us two years ago. She presented with uh, acute uh, al alcoholic pancreatitis. She developed a pseudocyst, a very large pseudocyst, and it was drained at the time endoscopically, transmurally, and we used a wall flex stent to drain that pseudocyst. We placed a double pigtail stent through that wall flex stent. Um, the procedure went very smoothly. However, one week after placement of the wall flex stent, she developed acute abdominal pain. She, uh, we brought her back, and we saw that the pigtail stent had actually migrated into the cyst. The wall flex stent had nearly completely migrated into the cyst, but fortunately, we could still grab uh, the end of the wall flex stent, the proximal end, and we could remove it. We then dilated the tract and we removed the migrated pigtail stent. We then placed two double pigtail stents and subsequently the cyst did resolve. Patient did well, but she returns now two years later with recurrence of her cyst. So uh, we're going to take a look uh, today at the cyst and see if it is a candidate for a repeat transmural drainage. Uh, but in this case, uh, we are planning to use the axial lumen opposing stent, particularly because of the prior experience where a tubular uh, self-expandable metal stent had migrated into the cyst. All right, so let's have the uh, EUS view on the left side and the endoscopic view on the right side. So let's just have two views. There we go. So you can see now with the endoscopic view, uh, there is no real bulging of the cyst. You can, you, there's some prominence of the posterior wall, uh, but this is not really what we call bulging. There's just uh, you know, some uh, impression on the posterior wall, but this is not a prominent bulge. Um, so at least, uh, although endoscopic drainage uh, is uh, still performed in some places, I think even those who perform endoscopic transmural drainage would be reluctant to perform an endoscopy guided drainage. We're going to pass the echo endoscope now into the duodenum and we'll start our examination here. And uh, really all we want to know uh, here from the duodenum is uh, what does the bile duct look like? Uh, what does the pancreatic head look like? Uh, and she already uh, is supposed to call a cystectomy so we don't need to worry about her gallbladder. So we see right here the uh, bile duct, there it is. You can throw some Doppler on there quickly and you'll see that there's no Doppler flow within the bile duct as expected. And we can measure out the size of her bile duct and it measures about uh, five millimeters. Uh, and below the bile duct here uh, is the pancreatic duct within the pancreatic head. This is the portal vein over here on the side. Uh, and we can uh, follow and trace the bile duct and the pancreatic duct as both of these converge towards the ampulla, which is right here. So there's the bile duct, there's the pancreatic duct. They join at the ampulla, and then they diverge into their respective planes. The bile duct goes caudal cranial along the duodenal wall, which is here, and the pancreatic duct runs along a more horizontal plane into the pancreas. So there's the PD going this way, and the bile duct goes this way, and then we can follow the bile duct up a little higher as it goes towards the common hepatic duct. And now we're just uh, turning now into the common hepatic duct towards the hilum. And this is the hepatic artery there. In contrast to the bile duct, you can see we have nice Doppler flow uh, on the hepatic artery. And if we push, uh, press on the pulse Doppler, you can see we get a nice arterial signal of the hepatic artery. That arterial signal is in contrast uh, to the portal vein, which is right here which gives a continuous flow. All right, so now we're uh, going to uh, fall back into the stomach and we're going to evaluate the remainder of her pancreas and look for uh, the recurrent cyst, which was seen on her CT scan. And there it is right now. We're going to decrease the magnification. And there's the cyst, uh, fairly anechoic. Looks like a single cavity. The contents of the cyst look fluid. I see virtually no necroses, so this would uh, actually be uh, a good uh, candidate for a, a smaller diameter axial stent that comes in two sizes, 10 and 15, and we can use the 10 on this one because we see virtually no necroses. I don't really see any at all down here. For necroses, we would want to look down here. Uh, we'll throw on the uh, zoom, and then we'll 
take a look at the bottom where the necroses usually uh, form uh, or are seen layering out at the bottom of the cyst. And there's really no necroses at all. So this is a uh, pure pseudocyst, a fluid cyst, uh, which by definition is a pseudocyst. And uh, let's measure out the size. Here we go. So we've got uh, 7.2 in one cross section, and we have on the other cross section 8. So about an 8 centimeter cyst, and if we zoom in on the wall now, we'll take a look at the, uh, the interposed wall right here. And you can see the bowel wall here, the stomach wall, the muscular propria is here. This is the wall of the pseudocyst. It's a fairly thick looking wall. There it is right there. And we can measure the distance of this wall. It will be definitely under a centimeter. So there it is at seven millimeters. Now, remember this is a chronic cyst, and therefore uh, the, the two cavities, um, uh, the, the wall is likely to be thickened. And uh, we expect the two cavities to be adherent, but even here you can see there's a little bright uh, area sandwiched between the wall of the pseudocyst. Let's zoom in on this a little bit more. You can appreciate this better. This is the pseudocyst wall. This is the wall of the stomach. And you can see this bright layer that's in between the two. And that's some fat between the two, meaning that there isn't really a complete fusion of the two uh, structures. However, we are using a lumen opposing stent so the only risk of the two cavities um, uh, separating from one another would be during the access. So once we place the axial stent, we should have apposition of these two lumens. All right, so we can uh, get started now. And we're going to uh, start with an FNA needle. And we will use a 19-gauge needle to gain access and place a guide wire, after which we will do a balloon dilation of the tract, uh, followed by placement of the axial stent. Uh, we currently do not have the hot axial stent available in the United States, and therefore uh, we uh, will need to gain access through an alternative method. And right now, this is probably uh, the most time-honored uh, way to gain access to the pseudocyst. You could use a cystotome. That would be another option. Problem with the cystotome, and it's a, it's a bit unwieldy, it's uh, difficult to use uh, through the oblique, uh, uh, the oblique exit of the echoendoscope. Uh, it's a very stiff instrument. Uh, we'll uh, take a look, uh, make sure that we're in good position on floral. So in a moment, we'll uh, switch to a, th uh, a three view, a triple view. OK, there's our scope in good position. And we're ready now to uh, puncture, and I'm just going to advance the needle forward a little bit. Let's just make sure that it has cleared the working channel, and it has. And now we can advance the needle forward. You can see the needle is up here. It's very bright. There it is. And we'll move this, pull the stylet back a little bit, and we'll enter into the cyst like this. And you can see it very nicely. And Kate here is going to remove the stylet now, and I'm going to hold the handle in firmly to make sure that it doesn't pull back accidentally. And we will first aspirate some of the contents. We're expecting these contents to look fairly clear. And if we can zoom in on this a little bit to show the contents. And Teresa, maybe you can bring the lights up just a little bit so that we can see. There we go. Thank you, Sarah. So here's the uh, contents, very clear, sort of a light brownish color. That's enough. We're going to send that off for CEA and amylase and for cytology, and now we're going to inject some contrast. This is uh, not uh, mandatory to do this, but uh, we usually do this just to get a better definition of the cyst anatomy, um, and uh, occasionally we'll see communication of the cyst with the pancreatic duct. And uh, we'll just wait for the cyst to start to fill up. This will give us a better uh, appreciation of the real size of the cyst. So now the bottom part is starting to fill nicely. And I have a feeling this is a very large cyst. 
Yeah, more. Okay. We're getting a better outline of the uh, cysts now. Keep injecting. There we go. So that's a nice uh, cystogram. And we'll take a x-ray of that. Uh, good. We're not seeing any communication with the PD, at least uh, not yet. And uh, let's inject some water now. That'll help disperse the contrast, thins that out a little bit more. And that might help us see communication with the PD if there is any. Okay. And now let's get the guide wire in. So we're feeding the guide wire through the 19 gauge needle. This is a 0.035 uh, wire. It's uh, a d the Jag wire. Has good stiffness and is now circling around the perimeter of the cyst. You can see that nicely on x-ray. All right. And now we're going to remove the 19 gauge needle. Full we first retract the thumb screw completely so that we don't accidentally advance the needle. And we will now do a one-to-one -one exchange, just like in ERCP, and we'll immediately clamp down on the wire. We can see the wire on EUS, so there's no need to monitor this with the x-ray. And I'm just pulling back as the assistant advances the wire forward. And once the uh, needle sheath is out, we can just confirm again with x-ray that we're in good position, which we are. And now uh, we are ready to advance uh, our balloon catheter. We're going to pass the valve back over the guide wire uh, because otherwise we get leakage alongside the wire. Uh, so one of the things uh, that we have to keep track of uh, is w whether we want the valve on or off. And of course, when we place the axial stent, we're going to want the valve off because that lure locks into the biopsy port. Okay, pull that off, please. So now we're going to pass the uh, hurricane balloon. This is a six millimeter uh, balloon. It has a very uh, a stiff catheter uh, coating that um, uh, very nicely penetrates through the wall. And before Boston Scientific developed the hurricane balloon, uh, we often had uh, failed to advance uh, any catheter across the wall into the cyst. We could get our wire, of course, into the cyst, but we couldn't get any catheter to go across the wall. Your ERCP catheters weren't stiff enough. Um, bougies weren't stiff enough. And the balloon uh, ca dilating catheters that were available at the time lacked the stiffness. Uh, so this was actually a, a huge breakthrough uh, when the company developed this balloon catheter. And you'll see that, I, that I'm able to get through. And you saw that, you know, it took a little bit of push to get it to penetrate um, through the wall. And I can tell you that probably would not have been possible using an ERCB catheter or a bougie. It's really the unique stiffness of this hurricane balloon that allows us to get through the wall um, uh, it, it practically all the time. So, you know, it's rare that we're not uh, able to get across the wall with the balloon catheter. Now, we're going to do this part under, uh, this is sort of a drawback of using the balloon for dilation. If you dilate uh, under EUS guidance or under floral guidance, um, because the scope is, is, is so close to the wall, uh, probably the balloon is not going to straddle the wall and you're not going to dilate the tract. You'll just dilate inside of the cyst. So you actually need to uh, pull away from the cyst and uh, watch the balloon dilation under endoscopic guidance. That's the only way to know for sure that you're dilating the tract. Uh, otherwise, it looks beautiful on x-ray, but you're not really dilating the tract. Um, of course, you might have some fluid already coming out from the cyst, as we are here. So let's get the balloon into good position. There it is. There's the end of the uh, catheter. We can start our uh, dilation now. So uh, we don't want to get pulled back too far because uh, we don't want to lose our, our position for endoscopic placement 
of the Axios stent. Uh, we'll have to recapture that in a moment, but there's the balloon dilation. Very nice, and now we can start to deflate, and now I can start to recapture um, the uh, position. Uh, this is where uh, the two cavities could easily separate uh, if they're not adherent. This is, we've now successfully, let's have the EOS view, please, on the left side. And um, we're going to now pull out the balloon catheter. We're ready to place the axial stent. So we've uh, now, uh, 10, uh, we have now adequately dilated the track so that the passage of the sheath for the axial stent, which is uh, about 11 French, 10.5, 10 uh, should uh, pass very smoothly. All of these steps, of course, are eliminated with the hot axials where you would just uh, uh, burn uh, through the wall uh, with just enough cautery to facilitate penetration of the wall uh, with the axial sheath. And once you're in the cyst cavity, you can immediately deploy the distal flange. Uh, so there's no uh, need to even place a guide wire. Uh, you can just immediately place your stent. Uh, there's no over-the-wire exchange. You eliminate that step. You, need, you eliminate the step to dilate the tract. It's basically just gain access and immediately place your stent. So that, of course, will s significantly simplify the procedure. Uh, but right now, as I said, we don't have that available. So our first step is to unlock the, um, the Axios uh, sheath here. And if we can get the lights up a little bit, and let's get the camera view of this. And I'll try to move this here. So you see that we have the handle that is lure locked to the biopsy port here. Uh, this is our, uh, our lock for the uh, sheath. We've unlocked it now. This is the hub uh, that we are now going to uh, push downwards, which will advance the uh, sheath containing the axial stent into the cyst. Uh, this upper hub is for the deployment of the stent. All right, so the first stent step is now just to advance the sheath forward. You can see on EUS it's advancing very smoothly, and I'm inside now, very nicely inside of the cyst. And the sheath is very echogenic, so you can see the sheath very nicely all the way to the tip right there. Once the sheath is, uh, is generously inside of the cyst, we can lock uh, the position of the sheath. Now we can re uh, release the safety uh, pin here, the yellow safety pin, and now we're going to unlock the, uh, st the stent release hub, and we're going to release the distal flange first. So we're just pulling back uh, here like this, and as we pull back, uh, what we're doing is just uh, pulling back on the sheath to release the distal flange. And there's the distal flange seen beautifully. It's very echogenic. You can see it nicely right there. And now it's fully deployed, and uh, we can pull back on the sheath a little bit. And we're not going to pull it all the way back, but just uh, bring it back towards the wall like this and then lock our position again. All right, now we can uh, switch to the endoscopic view. So we'll start putting some air into the lumen of the stomach until we can see the, the, uh, the white catheter. And uh, we're going to pull back the sheath until we see a black mark. Uh, so we're pulling back, and there's the black mark. Now we're going to lock again. And we're now going to release the uh, proximal flange. So we're just pulling back now again on the, uh, on the hub here, pulling back, keeping our view. And we should now see the proximal flange. There it is. There it is. And now it has deployed. It opened up completely, and you can see the fluid beautifully draining outside of the cyst. So we can uh, look at this also on uh, EUS again. So uh, we'll make the EOS image large for a quick moment, and you'll see that uh, the axial distal flange is here, here's the saddle portion of it, and then the proximal flange is inside the lumen here. So there's the, uh, the stent nicely inside of the cyst. You can see the distal flange fully deployed inside of the cyst. Very echogenic, and the transition to the saddle portion, which is right here. And then, of course, the uh, proximal flange is inside of the stomach. So what we're going to do now is um, uh, there's really no need, uh, per se, to go inside of the cyst. Um, but um, 
One in the differential diagnosis of any cyst that recurs, you need to th consider the possibility of a neoplastic cyst. So we're going to leave the guide wire in there. We're going to remove the Axios uh, catheter. Okay, so there's the, the tip, the, the, the cone or bougie shaped tip. And we're going to remove that, leaving the uh, wire in place. And I'm going to ask for that, um, for a 10 millimeter uh, dilating balloon, so 8 to 10. And we're just going to open this uh, stent lumen up to its maximum dia uh, diameter. Let's get the valve back on. Um, and we're going to then pass uh, through the stent with a transnasal scope, uh, which has a diameter of about 6 millimeters. So we should be able to pass through very easily. And we'll just take a little look around inside of the cyst. And the reason for doing that is actually just to be sure that there aren't any uh, features suggestive of a neoplastic cyst. Uh, which we don't think this is, but um, it's definitely always in the differential of a younger patient um, with a recurrent cyst. And we have the advantage that uh, now with the lumen opposing stent in place, we don't have to worry about the stent either being pulled out or pushing it in. It's firmly anchored across the wall of the, uh, of the bowel and the cyst. And um, uh, we can now use it as a port to uh, insert our endoscope and, of course, if any intervention like necrosectomy, um, uh, any kind of hemostatic therapy, um, uh, biopsies, uh, anything like that were indicated, that could easily be done uh, using the axial stent as a port to gain access to this extra luminal um, uh, uh, structure. Yeah, XP would be fine. So either transnasal or a pediatric gastroscope. So we're just passing our balloon, and we don't need to use floral for this. We can just uh, push it in to make sure it has it covers the length, uh, which is just one centimeter uh, of the saddle. Now we can dilate. So we want to keep the balloon, of course, in the axis of the uh, of the stent itself. That's good. So this is another feature of the hurricane balloon that's very nice. It's a very flexible balloon. You can see it's very easy to orient it um, in the desired uh, direction. Go up to 10, please, all the way. So this is the CRE balloon, which stands for Controlled Radial Expansion. It's basically, uh, it was at the time th uh, that it was developed uh, by Boston Scientific, uh, really a, a huge breakthrough that one could dilate in graduated steps, uh, similar to the way we use bougies in graduated steps to dilate strictures of the esophagus, for example. Okay, now go down. So this allowed us to uh, uh, basically save having to use three different size balloons. We could just use one balloon and incrementally increase the size and still adhere to the uh, rule of uh, threes. Uh, let's pull everything. We're going to switch scopes now. Let's just take a couple of photos here. The patient, by the way, is intubated. We always intubate patients uh, for pseudocyst drainage because there is a obvious risk of aspiration as the fluid gushes out. And um, you don't want to uh, have a successful pseudocyst drainage and have the patient die from pneumonia afterwards because of aspiration. All right, so now we'll switch to the pediatric gastroscope. So we're now passing through the esophagus. We're going to be in, land in the stomach in just a moment. There's the axial stent. So the idea of uh, a port to facilitate access, I can tell you if there were no stent here, it would be very difficult to intubate the tract because the tract's at a right angle to the axis of the uh, lumen uh, of the stomach uh, and therefore the axis of the endoscope. 
So uh, without this stent, it would be very challenging to turn your scope into that right angle and get through that tract. I can tell you it's, it'd be impossible. Uh, you could try to do it in retroflexion like this, um, and you might be able to engage the tip of your scope there, but then as soon as you start pulling back to go in, uh, it'll fall out. So from, uh, from, from many uh, hours of uh, trying to regain access uh, to uh, tracks that I've created with balloon dilation, uh, I can tell you that having a port is really uh, a huge advantage because now I can just engage the, uh, uh, the tip of my endoscope against the stent like this, tip up, and now the stent uh, will stabilize my position and I can just advance my scope right into the cyst. So the, uh, th this is more than just a, an access point. It's, it's actually a device that is facilitating or enabling easy access to the target structure. So there you can see the fluid inside of the cyst here. Here's the cyst wall. It looks like a typical cyst wall, which is very smooth. It's a pseudo wall. So it's just granulation tissue, really. There's no epithelium. And uh, we'll just suck out the fluid here. It's going to take a little longer because it's a pediatric astroscope. If we had placed a 15 uh, millimeter stent, uh, we could have gone through with the standard gastroscope. And of course, this would already be empty by now. So there are no, uh, there's no nodularity. There are no irregularities of the wall. Nothing suspicious for a neoplastic cyst. No papillary structures. Uh, that one might see with uh, a mucinous cyst adenoma or a IPMN. Essentially, we can completely uh, uh, clear out this cyst uh, endoscopically. The good news is uh, the cyst fluid does not look uh, infected. Looks clean. Getting a couple of suction hickeys here. So just be careful that we're not too aggressive with our suction, just intermittently while giving air. Because you don't want to suck up too aggressively against the wall because this is a pseudo wall. And there are lots of vessels. You can see uh, that we could go into the cyst now and um, we can push in and we could probably retroflex. There we are, retroflexing, see? So the uh, stent is, uh, again, anchoring the position and stabilizing the scope. So there's a retroflex view as if we were in the stomach looking back at the cardia. So now we get a complete view of the uh, cyst uh, interior, and we're 100% confident that we're not overlooking a neoplastic cyst. Okay, we're just about there. Okay, I think that's it's sufficient. We'll take a couple pictures, and we'll slowly pull out of the cyst and uh, through the axial stent. Any bleeding created by the tract dilation is being tamponaded by the stent. So this is uh, preventing any, uh, any, uh, pr any persistent bleeding. There's just some minor bleeding that uh, occurred at the time of the tract dilation. If you eliminate the tract dilation, um, uh, which of course can occur afterwards because we dilated up to 10 uh, afterwards, but the tract dilation prior to stent placement, if you use the hot axials, then you wouldn't even get that bleeding from the, uh, from the initial balloon dilation. We're done with the procedure, and uh, our plan on this patient is to leave that stent in for three months. Uh, we're going to allow the cavity to completely collapse down. It's, it's going to collapse down, of course, but we want it to scar down, and for that to occur, uh, we need to leave it in for a longer period of time. Uh, so we're planning on three months. We'll bring her back, and then uh, we'll do another EUS, and then we'll remove the stent if everything looks nicely collapsed down. Thank you.